Hello, I am pleased to be speaking to you at the Africa Studies Association Teachers Workshop 2022, and would like to thank the Outreach Council of the Africa Studies Association for this honor. My name is Akiwa Irie, and I teach kids about African history. I do this by writing and publishing children's books. And I do this because I was one of the kids for whom I write my books. I was actually in my early 20s when I learned about African history. And as far as I'm concerned, that is way too late. A little more about me. Um, I currently live in Ontario, Canada, but I was born in Nigeria, Benin City. Benin City is the location of my debut title, Idia of the Benin Kingdom. And this is the book we're going to be delving into today. I have created a short presentation, which I'll be going into soon. But first, I'd like to share a story with you. 10 years ago, I had my traditional wedding in Benin City. After my wedding, one of my relatives gave me a gift. It was one of the many gifts that I received on my wedding day, and I didn't think much of it. It was this mask. At the time, I was familiar with this mask as everyone in Benin City is, but I did not know the story behind it. I meant to hang it up, but I never quite got to it, and it was regulated to a box somewhere um, in my basement and forgotten. Meanwhile, my life moved on. I became a mother, and I did motherly things, like writing my first children's book on my heritage and culture when I noticed that such books did not exist. And it was while I was do, conducting my research on Queen Edia that I realized that this mask is actually of Queen Edia. Her son created masks like this of her after she died to honor her. And a few months ago, I found this, the mask again as I was decluttering. And now it holds a new meaning for me. And this is why I do what I do. And I imagine that they are others out there who see African regalia, artifacts, arts, proverbs, and do not quite understand the history that comes with them. And with my stories, I'm hoping to bridge this gap one book at a time. Now onto my presentation. For me, the goal with this book was to introduce kids and in essence, the world to this somewhat famous but little known character in African history. And I think that by now the world is coming to the realization that there is more to African history than is generally understood. Ilya's story, however, is special because while her face has been immortalized in a mask that is relatively mainstream, her actual story is not. And so that was why I, <laughs> I embarked on the journey on um, writing about Queen Edia. And one of my desired outcomes was that after reading this book, readers who come across Queen Edia's mask, which is almost inevitable, would know and understand what it represents. So I tackled this from two angles, the manuscript and the illustration. With the manuscript, my approach was to read and ask as many questions as I could about the Benin Empire and Queen Edia. And to do this, I looked at articles, blogs, journals, videos to learn as much as I could about Queen Edia. With this information, I could paint a picture about the time, the location of my, the time and location of my main character. And I also interviewed the most knowledgeable person that I knew about the culture, my mother, she provided for me a valuable um, resource for understanding the intricacies of the culture, the language, and the setting of my story. Now, taking a look at the setting of my story, uh, my story takes place in the Kingdom of Benin, which was an ancient civilization going as far back as the 1200s. It housed amazing structures, architecture, art and defensive walls. The kingdom is headed by a king called the Oba and his advisors. The kingdom was also said to be so safe and prosperous that its houses actually did not have doors. 
growing up myself in Benin, I was quite immersed in the culture, the festivals, the food, and the general way of life. On the screen, um, you see me and my twin sister um, with my mother. Um, it says all of this, all of each of these photographs is taking at different points of my life in Benin. Cultural values in Benin determine morning greetings, food, traditional dressing, religion, even burial rites. The current city itself is small. It consists of the Abbas Palace, a museum, art galleries, a street called Igu, and a uniquely placed roundabout in the center of the city called Ring Road. Um, every major road in a city is connected to Ring Road. The culture in Benin surrounds everybody who lives there. Replicas of Queen Edia's mask can be found all over the city on t-shirts, mugs, hats, school buildings. Um, there's actually a school in Benin named after Queen Edia. My sister attended that school. So Edia is someone that I, someone that I was aware of from a very young age. I mean, thinking about my book's illustrations, I really, want to I really wanted to incorporate as much of the culture as I could to provide readers with an immersive experience as one could with a picture book. Now I'd like to give you some background on Queen Idia. Born in the 15th century, Idia was a well-known wife to Oba Ozolwa, and she was a mother to Oba Isigye. Isigye is Oba who ruled the Benin Empire between 1504 and 1550. Not much is known about Idia's childhood, but we do know that before she became a wife and queen to Oz um, Oba Ozolwa, her official role in the kingdom was that of entertaining by dancing. She was actually noticed by Oba Ozolwa as she performed a dance during one of the traditional festivals at the time. Another aspect of her history that we know of is that in spite of the fact that she was known by profession as a dancer, she entered the palace very well versed in politics and diplomacy. Idia is regarded as playing a significant role in her son's rise and reign and is remembered as a great warrior who fought without fear. And so to reward and honor her, Oba Izigye created a new position within the court called the, the Iyoba, or the Queen Mother, which gave her significant political privileges, including a separate residence with its own staff. Idia was also a patron of the arts. She was responsible for many innovations, such as the Akasa dance, that is still used in Benin cultural dances to this day. Now, Idia's entire story was much too complex for a picture book. I actually wrote quite a few iterations of the manuscript for this book. In one of my first iterations, I chronicled all of the known written histories of Idia, focusing on her accomplishments as a wife and a yoba. And in that version of the book, I felt that my kids didn't quite connect with that version of the book. Uh, so I tweaked it and in a later versions of the book, the book evolved into a graphic novel with Idia searching for her place in the Benin Empire. Um, and with that, I think I just missed in missed the mark in explaining Idia's true essence. And as I read and I wrote more about Queen Idia, I found myself in awe of her ambition. She was almost ruthless in her drive to ensure that her son became king. It was almost as if she had a premonition that it was meant to be. And so in the final version of my manuscript, even though there isn't much information about Idia's childhood, I tried to imagine what her childhood may have been like to provide some answers regarding her ambition and her abilities as a woman. For me, the trifecta of Idia's talents were the dancing, um, her political acumen, and her spiritual powers. These three, these three ingredients were the focus of my manuscript. Now to enable me to simplify the storytelling in the actual book and yet still offer as much information as I could to readers, I chose to include facts pages at the end of my book to expand on facts pertaining to Idia and the Benin Kingdom. 
I also included a map that shows the geographical that show how the geographical boundaries of the kingdom have evolved over time. And this map also serves as a nice distinction between Benin, the empire, now city, and Benin Republic or Benin Republic, former kingdom of Dahomey, now country. Now I'd like to talk about, uh, I'd like to go into the illustrations and the research that fed the illustrations in my book. Um, but before I, I go into that, I'd like to acknowledge my wonderful illustrator, Alina Shabelnik. Alina is an illustrator from Ukraine. She loves to draw everywhere all the time, and she's extremely talented, and she was very patient in the very iterative process of illustrating this book. Now, one aspect of the illustration that I was very clear about from the beginning was the color of the ground in the region. Bidin is well known for its rich red soil, also known as Ulakma. The soil, um, on this page, I have some photographs of what the backdrop of the city looks like, as well as some illustrations from the book. As you can see, we tried as much as we could to give the red sand the presence that it deserves. Now onto the architecture. 17th century Dutch visitor Alfred Dapper referred to the houses in Benin as built alongside the street with one close to the other and adorned with gables and steps with broad long galleries inside. The houses in ancient Benin were made of the red sand that is found everywhere in the city and residents were said to keep their walls shiny and smooth by washing them and scrubbing them regularly. And in deciding on how to illustrate the architecture in my book, descriptions and images like this are what I refer to. Here are some more reference photographs on what the houses may have looked like in Benin City. For these, I refer to the digital collection of the National Museum of African Art, um, as well as a website called Entanglements. These photographs were the inspiration behind the appearance of the interior and exterior wall texture. One of the main characters in my book is Ilya's father. In my book, I imagined Ilya's father to be a warrior and elder, and I could not find actual photographs to use as reference for what a Benin warrior may have looked like. But we do have these intricately detailed sculptures in brass that give an accurate enough picture for us to base our illustrations on. Here, the warrior chief is wearing coral studded helmet and collar with crossed bandoliers. Now, in many parts of the African continent, clothes were not necessary because of the immense heat. And at the time the events in my book happened, most kids actually did not wear clothes. In this aspect, I chose to deviate from what may have been historically accurate, and I gave everybody in the book clothing. Now, though Africa is currently well known for its attire made of bold patterns, fabrics such as Ankara, these were actually only introduced to the continent in the 19th century. For everyday clothing at the time, I didn't have a lot of sources to go by. So I used these photos from the Museum of Fordance's collection to gauge how everyday clothing may have looked. I noticed that the clothing in the photographs were predominantly white wraps. And so that was my choice for the clothing that um, Idia and her friend Adisua wore. Now red is the color you will notice the most when you look at traditional Benin attire. Every other element in the upper ceremonial attire, aside from his skirt, is made from red coral or ivory beads. And these are some photographs that served as inspiration for this scene. The upper and his chief's attire have actually not changed much for hundreds of years. This outfit that is sometimes worn by the Benin chiefs is a reflection of the Western influence on Benin traditional apparel and accessories. During the time of Isigye, priests and missionaries who were Portuguese 
gave out some dresses to the Oba as relics of friendship with the Benin Kingdom. As you can see, these dresses um, bear a striking resemblance to what is worn by a Roman Catholic Reverend Father. And to this day, Benin chiefs wear these attires as part of their royal regalia. And lastly, this is an image from the last page in the book. This page was important for me. On this page, the goal was to showcase Edia in her glory by merging some of the most famous artifacts on her, the ivory mask, the pendant mask, and Idia surrounded by her attendants, depicting her going to war. My picture book on Edia also has an accompanying activity book that gives readers an opportunity to engage even more with the Benin culture and history. I had initially planned to do a simple 10 to 20 page activity book, but I found that to cover the depth of the history, the culture, and Idia's story, the activity book would need more pages. And in this now 50 page activity book, we have coloring pages that include Benin artifacts, simple mazes, and puzzles that are based on the book. Uh, when I published my book, I was pleasantly surprised by the positive feedback that I received from teachers and homeschoolers who were using my books in classrooms and in lessons. It was memorable for me because while my initial goal was to introduce African history to kids one household at a time, the concept and skill of doing this at the classroom level proved to be far more satisfying than I had ever imagined. So in response to the support that I received from educators, I worked with other educators and I created lesson plans and study units to accompany this title. Thank you. So all, um, I really wish that um, Ekiwa Eire was here in person to answer your questions because she's, she just, she created a really fantastic uh, book uh, right here. Uh, and uh, again, she's got all of these various sources uh, that you can also go to uh, in the back. You can just see the, the, the gorgeous illustrations uh, that um, she was uh, very thoughtful about. Um, here in the back, there are these, here's that, that image and the resource pages, right? With Queen Idia, with the architecture, with the map. And as well, in the back of this book, you have curricular linked resources uh, that can be shared here, okay. So again, I, I do wish that she was here in person to uh, talk about and answer your questions. Uh, what I'm going to share uh, for you now are really all I need to do is show you a few images more um, because she's she's done all the rest. Uh, when I look at this book, uh, you you uh, she's taking you through that journey. Uh, uh, as I said, very, very thoughtful. She did her, her research, but also think about it, right? Here she was, she grew up in Benin. Uh, she hadn't heard about this history until her early 20s. Uh, and in fact, you are looking at a city which uh, was uh, one of the largest of its kind uh, in, uh, in the world. Uh, it was linked globally through trade. Uh, there were diplomats uh, from Portugal. There were diplomats from, from Benin to Portugal, okay, uh, to interact through trade. Uh, and, 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 um, and yet, yet uh, because of something, an event that happened in 1897 that she doesn't talk about, um, uh, uh, because there, you know, this is a particular point that she wants to make and make that she makes very well. Um, the city was destroyed. Uh, and so if you walk around Benin City today, you will not find 
um, uh, this this uh, vast uh, palace complex. So I want to show you some of that and also uh, give you another resource that can complement another storybook that can complement hers uh, to, to look at the city itself. So you have the story as well as um, of Idia, as well as the site. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, and I actually need to be listed as a host. Um, my hosting has been- I just changed your setting, sorry, Tavi. Great, thank you, Elsa. All right. And can you see my images at this point? I hope. All right. Um, so here in the background, uh, and we'll take a look at it again at this again, is uh, a um, a drawing, an illustration of the Benin Kingdom by Olfert Dapper, who um, uh, Ekua actually mentions. Uh, and it dates to 1668. I'm sorry, I'm fine, trying to find my cursor here. Move us along. So here is Idia of the Benin Kingdom. And the other book that um, I want to suggest may complement it is Osasu and the Great Wall of the Benin Empire. Now, um, there are some issues with uh, the Osasa textbook that we can we can talk about um, uh, in a little bit. Uh, however, um, it does lead into, uh, as I mentioned, other discussions that could be had. So here, you've already seen these images uh, with her presentation, so I'll move on, but she does focus on a historical individual. Uh, and the mass that, that she showed us is a copy of this uh, extraordinary um, uh, ivory mask that was carved and it actually had at one point metal inlays here. And what she didn't explain is all around here, these are actually stylized Portuguese heads because they were so important uh, to trade and wealth. Uh, and they so they wrap around as if they are a part, uh, an integral part of her coiffure. Here are two illustrations or an illustration page and a written page from uh, the, other, the other book, Osasu. And here is where we can start to see those polished walls and some of the features of the Benin Kingdom. Now, um, uh, uh, the author talks about uh, the fact that it was known for its beauty, its wealth, uh, that it was peaceful and, harm and harmonious. These are actually words of Europeans uh, beginning with the, the Portuguese who arrived in the 15th century. These are actually their words uh, of, of uh, the Benin kingdom. And the Benin kingdom itself uh, was known for, for not having crime. Uh, again, no, there weren't locks on the, on the doors. There just wasn't need uh, as Ekua stated. They were all, it also was very sophisticated in having huge metal lamps, uh, as you see accurately portrayed in these illustrations, uh, that were lit uh, with these um, uh, uh, lanterns fueled by palm oil. And that was one of the major uh, trade items that um, the British uh, and others wanted uh, control of. So here you got to hear a little bit of her growing up in Benin, right? But yet this extraordinary story that it wasn't until her 20s that she began to hear about Idia and understand Idia's um, uh, consequence in history and the Benin city. So she showed you a wonderful map. This just gives you a scale. And remember that the Benin kingdom is one of many kingdoms uh, and capital urban cities that had existed. You can look at, at look at these these dates, right, uh, to show you that um, that urbanization, uh, large cities were nothing new to the African continent. And here we see the Benin Kingdom, and then the spread of its influence across a wide swath of what is today Nigeria. I'm giving you a lot of maps and ideas. You could actually use Google Earth in your classroom 
uh, for discovering the outlines of, of, uh, of where they believe the Benin walls uh, were. Uh, and here's a reconstruction of internal and external walls. Um, now, uh, um, to give you uh, an idea of what people said when they arrived, uh, seeing uh, the uh, the Palace of Benin and, and this huge city, uh, the, uh, a Portuguese ship captain, uh, Captain Pinto, in the 15th century stated, Great Benin, where the king resides, is larger than Lisbon. All the streets run straight and as far as the eye can see. The houses are large, especially that of the king, which is richly decorated in his fine columns. The city is wealthy and industrious. It is so well governed that theft is unknown. The people live in such security that they have no doors to their houses. So again, that storybook, as as, as um, Ere stated, she did a lot of in-depth research and, and what she writes about is coming out of, of, of these first-hand accounts and, and other historical documents. Uh, they did cite um, these wide streets, clean houses, these well-fed populations, a centralized, sophisticated bureaucracy, which they could understand themselves. Uh, and indeed, at the time that the Portuguese first arrived, Portugal was small. Uh, it was uh, uh, much less wealthy as the Kingdom of Benin. Uh, the Benin Kingdom had a standing, uh, um, a standing army. It had, again, great wealth. It had taxes across an uh, that were, were gathered uh, across an extraordinary area. In this photograph uh, by Dapper, what we're actually seeing is a central area, uh, a very small area, really, even though it looks huge, uh, of um, the internal area of, of the walled city. Uh, and these are uh, the palace uh, is illustrated here with these turrets, uh, and there's all kinds of amazing artwork that covered uh, the, the palace and, and the other residences, and a lot of um, uh, deep, rich history there with the arts and the metaphors of the animals and the other figures that, uh, that permeated um, uh, these buildings. In comparison, Bruce Holling Holsinger, who uh, holds a PhD in history and English, uh, compared London at the same time, a city which is described as, quote, one of thievery, prostitution, murder, bribery. A thriving black market made the middle city ripe for exploitation by those with a skill for the quick blade and a picking a pocket. Uh, here in the city of Benin, they actually had um, sewer systems underneath to carry wastewater and rainwater through, whereas this the same time in London, people were throwing their waste from chamber pots out their windows onto city streets, okay? And I'm just finding my cursor here. So why are these walls so spectacular? Well, while very little of these uh, remain, there are fragments that have been discovered. Um, these earthworks, these ditches uh, that were still uh, surviving uh, in 1897, uh, they wrapped around uh, um, more than nine miles within the city proper, but over 9,900 miles throughout not only the city proper, but throughout uh, the Benin rural community. And in fact, it linked some 500 settlements and attached communities to Benin city proper, the capital. Um, and uh, the, the walls themselves were known as Ia, as mother. And so think about the idea of encapsulating, of protecting uh, um, this, this, this city. And here I've just pulled a couple of images. This gives you a sense of scale. His, this man is, is kneeling on the ramparts here. Uh, this is uh, the height of a wall. These walls were built in a wall and ditch, so they would create a huge ditch. Um, the, the Europeans called them moats, but they weren't filled with water unless it was raining, right? Um, but they used those, those to pull the mud up and create these huge uh, walls, defensive walls. And, and this one, uh, uh, this photograph here, uh, was after the punitive es es expedition. All of the walls had these large uh, gates, the gates, uh, were carved and decorated, and you can see that 
uh, this earthenwork architecture uh, also would be elaborated with, um, with ridges and sculptures. Now, here is a photograph that uh, Ekua also showed. This is one of the few uh, photographs that exist. This was taken in 1870, uh, 1897 by the British when they invaded uh, the city of Benin. Uh, and it shows some of the, the streets on the interior uh, here, the, uh, some of the interior, interior walls, which were smaller, and then the houses that would run, run past. Now, these might not look that smooth to you here as they might have looked, um, say, uh, at the end of the rainy season when they've been replastered. So think about Dawit's presentation uh, of earthen architecture, uh, for example, in Jenny. Over here, these are some of the remnants that are believed to be remnants of this fast wall system. And there's actually wall systems uh, that cover a huge area of Nigeria itself. Some of those much earlier in date than the Benin, uh, than the Benin walls. So here, a quote by one of the individuals who's been working uh, on finding and, and um, and showing these is all over this region, uh, sorry, Pete Darling, all over the region, and that means present day Nigeria, you find that the societies that had ramparts seem to have been more cohesive and to have survived for longer against outsiders. This makes sense, right? So why these structures? However, the thinking is that there may have been something much more to that as well, because these are not standard, as you'll see. These, are, these aren't just defensive. Um, there was incredible thought and mathematics involved in the construction of these. The structures may have actually had some uh, further symbolic and spiritual meaning. Uh, what's passed down to us uh, from uh, individuals, the Edo living in the area now, is that they represented a boundary between the world of the living within these walls and the world of the spiritual that lay outside these walls. Here, uh, a drawing on your left from 1897 of one of the British officers who were involved in um, the, the, the pillaging and looting of, of the Benin city. And then on your right is a reconstruction. Remember, over 9,000 miles of walls, 900 miles just within the city center. Uh, and look at that, the detail, the construction. So what, uh, what is known about this is that this was likely built on the idea of fractals. And here, this is where you have shapes that are replicated uh, in uh, from the small to the much larger over and over and over again. This is a, a form of mathematics that wasn't discovered until much later in date, but is used in African architecture, not just in Benin. And in fact, Rong English, who has studied fractals in Africa, uh, stated uh, um, when Europeans first came to Africa, they considered the architecture very disorganized in this quote unquote primitive, right? It never occurred to them that the Africans might have been using a form of mathematics, here fractiles, that they hadn't even discovered yet. So if you teach a math class, for example, you can actually you, uh, actually uh, globalize it, use Africa content in, in talking about fractals by using the city of Benin. Here, a couple of other reconstructions. This is part of the exterior. This shows you very well this, this digging of ditches to create these large earthen walls. And then, I'm sorry about that, going forward here. Uh, and then you would have these gateways and, and the houses, um, the workshops, uh, the, the offices, all of these uh, um, uh, uh, spaces for gathering as well within the city walls. This is a replication of the internal area where the palace was. And in Dapper, uh, Olfet Dapper's um, drawing of, of the 1600s, you actually saw some of these tall turrets with these ibises and the snakes running down. These all unfortunately don't have time to go into um, the meanings uh, of, of, of uh, the, these works of art. Now, I, I really um, like the fact that in these books of, of Idia and Osasu, you get that perspective of the Edo peoples because 
when uh, this occurred in 1897, the Edo Bini, they described it as a massacre. And it was, we, we really don't have the accounts of how many people were killed by the British when they invaded. Now, the British called it a punitive or punishing expedition. But we know that the British were looking for a way to take control of trade that Benin still had a hold on. Uh, the trade in particular palm oil, as well as ivory uh, and other, other elements uh, uh, along this, this rainforest trade. Uh, and so they actually um, uh, tried to provoke um, uh, uh, interactions uh, and war, really, uh, with uh, uh, Benin. And so they went in and um, uh, in a confrontation, uh, several, several British officers were killed. And so they went back um, several months later and literally burned, looted, and destroyed Benin City. And what you're seeing here are images of this looting, this pillaging, this plundering of the artworks uh, here of the ivory. This is within the palace. Okay, so you're seeing palace storage areas uh, here. Uh, uh, here are these open verandas uh, for air that people could sit at. These are all of these brass works now known as Benin bronzes uh, that were taken back to, uh, to Britain and remained in uh, the British Museum, still remain in the British Museum unless they were, they, were, they were sold off. The Oba himself was exiled. Um, uh, and in an earlier presentation, I actually showed a photograph of uh, the Oba in exile that was taken by W.J. Sawyer, uh, a photographer uh, in Calabar where the Oba was exiled too. Uh, sorry, let me go, go in. Uh, here. Um, so some of the objects that were taken were plaques. These are the kinds of things that actually line the walls uh, of the cities and the pillars of, of the palace. Indeed, this particular plaque replicates the pillars uh, and the entranceways uh, to the palace. Here, this would, would show you in full, if it were not damaged, one of those tall uh, turrets with the ibis on top, the snake running down. Uh, and all of this actually even represents altars where uh, uh, the heads of, of uh, Benin kings and queens, the ancestors, would be located. This is an image of an Oba and his sources of power. The Oba was known as uh, the king of land or the leopard. And so you see him actually holding leopards, uh, but also was able to uh, control the powers of the waters, which were said to be with Olokun. And Olokun is noted by these mudfish here. So he has the powers of land and sea, and he unites them in and of himself. Uh, the the um, accoutrements of red coral beads that Equa talked about are actually worn in reality and would have been worn by uh, the Oba at this time. But these plaques, uh, there were hundreds of them. There are hundreds of them. And when they were removed, the order was lost and this order uh, correlated to literally a history, a pictorial history that uh, could trigger, uh, these images could trigger the oral history of this kingdom, the, the political actions, the, um, the, 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 uh, the lineage of these obas. So it was a rich um, uh, cultural heritage for the Edo peoples. Now, if you want to use this, you could actually use it as current events, because even though there has been 125 years since the taking of these works, the looting of these works by the British, uh, and requests since then to have them returned to Benin, uh, it was October 11th of this year. So just this past month, the Smithsonian has led the way and has given back, this is Smithsonian National Museum of African History, has given back 29 of, I believe they have 32 or 34 objects from Benin to, uh, to Benin. Uh, they have said that they do not belong uh, um, in the museum. They are not the owners of these works. Through provenance work, they, they, they found out that these works were among those looted by the British. And so they have gone back. 
Uh, and so I was, I was lucky enough to be in DC a week ago and I ran to the National Museum, which is an extraordinary research, uh, as you heard in one of the earlier presentations. I wanted to see what they had done. And so they have left uh, for the moment uh, these, uh, this is how they had been displayed. There's nothing there anymore except a plaque that says what has been removed. And it has very strong language about, and rightfully so, about the looting, about the pillaging, about the burning of Benin. Uh, this is in contrast to the negotiations that are going on uh, with the British Museum. Uh, um, uh, they are actually in dialogue. It's called the Benin Dialogue. And so they're in, in dialogue. They hold most of these works. And I want to check our time, make sure not, we're not running out of time for discussion here. Um, but they hold most of the work still. Uh, of the Benin Kingdom. And so they're in dialogue of what will be given back, what will be kept, kept what will be digitized, uh, um, who will actually own the objects and who will be able to have the rights to loan them out. But again, the Smithsonian said, these don't belong to us. And so they went home. Uh, and, uh, you know, that really is an extraordinary thing uh, for, for a museum uh, in the West to relinquish as they did, and I hope it's a model for, for other museums. So I'm gonna stop here so that we can have time for questions uh, and comments. And I see that there's a lot of, of, of comments here. Please feel free to unmute yourself uh, to ask questions. Uh, and Liana, jump in as well. I know you're gonna be talking uh, about some of these books later. A question from Mondi, thank you. Yes, um, both of you, fabulous presentation. I really applaud the young lady who is now, who has a chance, who's had a chance to rediscover a part of her history. Um, and, um, you know, it was odd. I'm, I'm a docent with the National Museum of African Art and it, the conversation was getting increasingly difficult to have with people recognizing that we weren't the original owners of the artwork. And then, you know, the, the museum is so controversial because it is so political. I'm really glad we did what we did because um, for me, I would tell the story and it was difficult to tell that story because, you know, many people use the British history books as their sort of a compass for understanding and everything about Benin and the whole story around the art form itself uh, with the bronze, you know, the fact that that was passed down for generations and generations to, to the people of Benin, you know, was not even recognized or appreciated by these British massacres. And so who was really the savage here, <laughs> you know? And so exactly. um, it, 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 it's, it's just such a complex, you know, um, it, it was very difficult as an African-American person to, you know, concede and, and, and say that this actually happened. And so um, I'm proud of the museum for doing what they did. And I'm glad that uh, the author and others in her country now can, you know, kind of put the puzzle back together and, you know, be very proud of, um, uh, of a generation that, you know, had innovation around architecture, certainly around a bronze art form that is still passed on today. Um, that um, I can't think of the exact name right now because I'm just uh, old, but uh, you know, is wonderful. So thank you both for sharing the truth and the true story. Well, I so appreciate that you've been able to uh, join us today, Mondi, be, uh, for your perspectives, right? Um, and, and yes, you know, I went to Nigeria and I, I, at that point in time, I had no idea that I would not see any remnants of the Benin palace, right? And I went into a museum and what I found were two broken, uh, sculptures, damaged sculptures of, of Oba, Oba heads, portraits of the Kings. Uh, and this is what they had to show in the museum. Um, and, uh, it was it was heartbreaking, right? It was really really heartbreaking, um, and so 
uh, to hear that it took uh, um, ECWA uh, until her early 20s to learn about this, it's no surprise to me, right? It's no surprise to me. And it's no surprise to me that my students are angry, again, angry now when they hear that they didn't learn about these things. And it's literally the reason I got involved because I started to see as an artist incredible work uh, from the continent of Africa. And the iconography just blew my mind. Iconography, the meanings of every little detail, even the material it was made of. There was a reason for the material it was made of. And I thought, why haven't I seen this? Why haven't I heard about it? And it was when I was in college as an undergraduate. And I switched out of the arts and went into art history because I wanted to know, right? Um, and, and so it's wonderful to have these, these voices of individuals uh, like um, like Equa who can tell that history themselves, because you know that is the most important. Those first person experiences, right? For sure. And it and gives it was teachers that ability to use those first voices. And you know, my mom was listening earlier. She's eighty seven years old, and uh, uh, we're from Haiti, and she's born and raised in Haiti, and she remembers still that the friar, I guess, whatever priest you know, figure, um, but a foreign priest figure was the one who taught them about Haitian history <laughs> until, you know, that evil dictator said, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, that was the one thing uh, Duvalier did was, no, Haitian history will be taught by Haitians and will be, you know, and lots of Haitian people had written about the Haitian history, Toussaint, Dessalines and whatever. But we, my mom, when she grew up was learning it from the perspective of a, of a European, <laughs> and a European right. religious figure. And if you think about the fact that these missionaries came, not always with the best intentions, <laughs> particularly the Portuguese, they became one of the most brutal, apparently, of missionaries when they were colonizing uh, some of the African countries. So that history, you know, who tells that history and somebody was saying it earlier, put yourself in the person's shoes, you know, you, you, that the, it changes the whole perspective, you know? And all of this is happening at the same time that Hannah is doing her book on 1619. The New York Times had that big expose on Haiti. The truth is finally really setting us, is, is empowering us in ways that, you know, are just incredible anyways <laughs> yeah yeah and and you know it is important for all of us yes. right uh um i am just so thankful that i was able to give my children a very different upbringing right be able to share uh the not just the stories from from the con of africa but elsewhere in the world yeah. right yeah. Um, and, and thankful as well, because, you know, I have, I have nieces and nephews who are African-American, who are Hispanic, uh, and I want them to feel a part of the history. I want them to feel that when they go into a classroom, they are there, they are yeah. represented. If they're in a museum, right, they see themselves. They see themselves in stories. Because um, it's, a, it's a human story, you know, exactly. not, you know, they have dehumanized it so much that when you read the truth, you understand these are, this, these were people like you and I, you know, yes. you know, and because yes. all civilization started in Africa, they may very well be your relative. Yes, yes. And, and you know, um, this, this colonial narrative is really so recent in history. Okay. Uh, so uh, I went very quickly over one of my images uh, um, in a in a previous uh, presentation of of one of the diplomats, yes, uh, you know in in the you know in the in the in the fifteen hundreds in the sixteen hundreds in the seventeen hundreds there was equality, yes. uh, and it, it you know we we were talking about the era of humanism, uh, and um, there was respect, and this changed right with um with uh, uh Europeans being able to to come in greater numbers on the continent it changed with uh with um technology of guns uh yes. the mechanism of of weapons and then the narrative changed right to be because you have to change that uh if you want to be a, a quote unquote good christian uh how can you enslave individuals if you want to be a good christian how can you on another continent in in berlin 
say, okay, we're slicing up an entire continent like a piece of pie, and mm -hmm. you get this section, you get this section, you get this section, right? You have to change the narrative. You have to change it to, oh, we're, we're, we are the protectors of these people. They're childlike, et cetera, right? We've grown up with all of that. We have lost this, this, this world history in a very short time span. And that's what I talk about with this latent history, right? This problem that we've been left with a hole. And when you have a hole, you fill it. And yes. unless you go out and learn these things yourselves, you are filling it with the easiest things that you find, right? Uh, those Disney stories, right? Look at, <laughs> look at Tarzan. If you watch animated Tarzan, you will not see an African anywhere. It's too problematic, right? As if, as if uh, that land was- Those the are the things that need to people. be banned. Those are the books that need to be banned. Not these new books that these young, this young lady is, you know, compiling. Right. And, and just this whole discussion, you know, around banned books. It's just right. uh, crazy, crazy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, so, uh, thank you both for a great presentation. Pavi, thank you. I would I would oh, like I'm, to jump in here. Yes, go ahead. No, I was just saying the interview for me was so powerful because I had just read the book. So there is nothing like hearing the, from the author. So I was wondering that that's a great um, uh, tape. Is, is, will that be available for teachers to use? Yeah, okay. Yes, so all of these recorded materials uh, we'll be on the African Studies Outreach Council's website. You'll be able to access it. We'll have also these extended resources as well for you to, to access. Yes, we want you to have these things. Yeah, yeah, because it just brings it all together. And when you hear the, the genesis of the story and hear it from the author, it, uh, it makes it a much more, it makes it even more powerful than what it is. So yes. thank you. Yeah, okay. Yes. Thank you, Tavi, so, so much for complimenting um, Giwa's book in such a, a, a wonderful historical manner as well.